Hi there. Welcome back. In this section, I would like to talk about how some strange experimental results really motivated the creation of quantum mechanics and how this uh, thing came into being. So we'll, we'll talk about first um, about black body radiation. And that's a, a very old experiment. People uh, uh, created um, spectrometers where they looked at uh, the wavelength um, and the intensity of radiation coming out of objects. And they defined something called a black body, which is an opaque object um, where um, it's black. It uh, has a, maybe a hole, a pinhole out of which radiations emerged, or an object that might be far away, which um, you observe. And uh, in this in this fictitious black box, or in the physical uh, black box, you assume that um, uh, there's some radiation on the inside, and you measure what comes out. And uh, what had been observed is that the radiation intensity is temperature dependent. And what's interesting is that the peak of these um, curves is actually moving in and is not constant. And there were some a variety of theories that were created for that uh, to understand it. And here the um, graph that is uh, on a linear scale is now put on a logarithmic scale and you can clean more, see more clearly how this peak here moves as a function of wavelength. And early on uh, there were theories, uh, there's a Rayleigh genes formula that is quite famous that goes linearly in temperature and uh, by the fourth power in the wavelength. And it can um, match, sort of, uh, the, the, the rising curves are, uh, from the right, or the falling curves, if you read the graph, uh, in, in the order of wavelength. So, so it can match some experimental uh, information um, in the log scale. So there's a minus 4 in the wavelength and a plus 1 in temperature. Uh, Vine came up uh, with another formula based on classical uh, fitting uh, and understanding that um, matches the curve uh, coming from a low wavelength, but it could not properly predict the decay. So it goes as lambda to the fifth power and has an exponential uh, with uh, the wavelength in it. Now, Planck came up with a fitting formula like this. And uh, it looks like a pretty complicated thing, but it can basically match these curves, the experimentally observed curves. And <clears throat> let's interpret this formula a little bit in a different way. So uh, the original uh, description was in terms of lambda and temperature. Uh, let's translate that through a differential into frequency and temperature and uh, look at this formula uh, more carefully. So as you dissect um, this expression, you have three components uh, that are multiplied with each other. Um, you can interpret uh, F square as the number of modes that are in this black body. You can have an occupancy of these modes, uh, how many of them are activated. So again, you have the concept of number of modes that are available in the system, the resonator, <clears throat> how many resonances can this resonator contain? and uh, which ones are uh, occupied or utilized. Thinking of your guitar, it might vi vibrate on a particular frequency, so it has an occupancy of one of the modes, but it doesn't necessarily occupy all of the modes. And this is a thermal distribution here. And then you can calculate or assume or identify, better said, um, the energy of a single mode that is then occupied. Now, this is an interesting aspect that the electromagnetic emission in the system occurs for discrete quanta. So there's something discrete about light emission coming out of a black box. So that was the first advent of seeing that light may be having a, a discrete nature to it rather than the, the typical a known understanding of a continuous wave. All right, now 
much, much later in the 1990s, there's been a, a famous picture that is now uh, coming from Kobe satellite data that measured um, uh, systems. And the, the actual measurements lay beautifully on top of uh, the, the, uh, the theory, the Planck's expression. And it, it fits so beautifully, perfectly, and uh, it shows that the cosmic background temperature is about 3 Kelvin. So you can match it very nicely to, the, to, this, to this theory. All right, let's look at something else that was uh, throwing people off uh, in their understanding of physics. Well, people like to uh, light things on fire, right? And uh, uh, there have been experiments where a prism uh, was being used to analyze, or prisms were being used to analyze uh, light. It was an understanding that uh, white light splits out into a um, rainbow of many colors. And it turns out if you do that experiment on chambers of materials and look at light emission from, say, um, helium, you see certain uh, hydrogen, or you see uh, a light emission out of uh, iron, you see that these materials have all different spectral lines. They don't emit a continuum of um, spectra. They don't emit a continuum of light waves. So there's something discrete about the light coming out of hot hydrogen. There's something discrete about uh, uh, light coming away or going away from hot iron. And uh, we use some of this, for example, not, not too much today anymore because we have LEDs that are powerful, but sodium lamps used to be the um, lamp of choice if you really need a really bright light. Um. So out of this stems the uh, the development of atomic orbitals, and we'll, we'll dive into this very briefly. So here's a sort of a pictogram of this experiment. You might have a chamber that is uh, filled with hydrogen that is hot, and you send the light um, through a prism, and as well as a pictogram, and what you do measure is discrete lines. So here's a spectrum of lines, and and what is interesting is that you can interpret these lines with a relatively simple two-indexed integer formula. There's a constant up front, and you can identify these lines as 1 over m squared minus 1 over n squared. You identify these lines as 1 over m squared uh, minus 1 over n squared. So these are different series of observations people have made, and that the interpretation can be seen here on the right, where there's a lowest lying level at minus 13.6 eV, and then you have a series of lines of integers connecting to this n equal 1. And then there's other series that connect to uh, uh, intermediate states or lines. So people talked about... Uh, People that observed them gave them the names of the Lyman series, Bama series, Passion series. So these are old experiments that occurred before the advent of quantum mechanics. So that constant then turns out to be 13.6 eV electron volt, and that is the Rydberg constant, because Rydberg I know, was the person that identified it like this. All right, so how do we get a... Uh, a description out of this that kind of makes sense. And this started to create the Bohr atom model that can understand these lines. So if we consider an electron on a circular motion around the core, it will have a momentum um, by uh, the virtue of its mass moving around uh, in, a, in, a, in a circle. It has a velocity. And what if, we, what if we assumed that this momentum were quantized? It's just an assumption. And you quantize it by that the angular momentum here is quantized in integer numbers of uh, Planck's constant normalized by 2. That means that ultimately also the uh, velocities are 
quantized. And that ultimately, if you balance the attractive force between uh, the electron and the core, and it's um, uh, the energy that drives it away due to circulation, you can find that the radii of each uh, 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 quantized numbers is now quantized in numbers of n squared. All right, so if the radius is, uh, if you have discrete radii, you can now think of multiple orbitals of electrons around this core. You have multiple kinetic energies around this, and you have a potential energy that is in, uh, encaptured as well. Where, and you set the relative scale that uh, the potential energy is zero at infinite radius. All right. Uh, you add the kinetic energy and the potential energy, and you find that it is discrete as a function of the integer. And therefore, you calculate an EN as 13.6 EV electron volts divided by N squared. And the ground state is at n equal 1. And as you increase n, um, you um, elevate an electron into multiple orbitals, and you can explain the transition energy between orbitals as the difference between 1 over m squared minus 1 over n squared. And with that, you can explain the fundamentals of these emission spectra. And really, the the uh, Bohr atom model was born out of experimental observations and the assumption of a quantized orbital momentum. So, of course, then formulations emerged that, that really are based on Schrodinger's equation, and you have 3D solutions of Coulombic potentials, and you have these spherical harmonics. We'll talk a little bit about those more. Um, but the fundamentals of that is really a simple orbital model that the energies of an electron inside an atom are quantized. All right. Again, you have a standing wave of an electron, and you normally think of an electron as a particle rather than a wave. And that standing wave has discrete energies. Now, the wave equation that is being solved for that is, is slightly different than the normal electromagnetic wave. But still, it is a wave equation that leads, a, sta a quantized wave equation that leads to these quantized states. All right, let's get to uh, the photoelectric effect that was also uh, a long-standing puzzle uh, for 55 years. People have observed uh, light emission um, on clean surfaces. So light can eject electrons from a clean metal. And uh, that has been observed by many researchers and really not uh, expre uh, explained for 55 years. And there's an article on that here in the Wikipedia. So what are some of the unexplained problems that, that occurred? Um, the interesting concept was that electrons were emitted immediately without any time lag. So people sh uh, uh, show them. Um, shine light on, on that surface, and immediately uh, electrons might come out. Now, that is, um, was counterintuitive in the understanding that you might have to, quote-unquote, provide a, an, a certain amount of energy, and that buildup of energy would have to take time in order for then electrons to come out. But the response was, according to experiments, instantaneous. The light intensity increases the number of electrons, but not their energy. Again, that goes against the sort of understanding, I dump in more energy, and eventually what comes out um, is going to have more energy. But it only increased the intensity, uh, the, <clears throat> the number of electrons that are coming out. Red light will not cause emission no matter what. So there seemed to be something about the wavelength of the electrons coming in that um, may or may not enable electrons to be ejected from this metal. Um, weak 
violet light will eject few electrons with high energy. So light has to have seemingly a minimum frequency or color to excite these electrons to come out. So there is a frequency dependence. All right, that could be fitted to a, a curve like this. The emitted electrons have a, a light uh, dependent energy and that de energy depends on the frequency and this the solution came in 1905 and Einstein got a, a Nobel Prize for this in 1921. And the essence is that light can be described by discrete particles of discrete energy that are related to Planck's constant. So that relates back to the black body radiation as well, but really Einstein put it together uh, in, it, in the explanation of the photoelectric effect. And what that means is you might have a, a, a binding energy as skipped on, uh, sketched on the top right that binds electrons into this metal. Uh, you measure that against, say, a vacuum energy. So inside the metal, uh, they are bound. And as electrons, uh, as photons come in at a certain uh, energy, they need to at least exceed the binding energy. And the kinetic energy that the electrons have uh, is in excess of the light energy minus the, to the binding energy. All right, so that's the essence here. And so that means the kinetic energy that they come out with is the difference between the light frequency and um, the minimum frequency that is required to resolve an electron out of the system. All right. So that means that light consists of particles, and that's how we think of them as photons. All right. So here's another pictogram of that experiment. So you have light coming in electrons coming out at a energy that is uh, smaller than the light energy minus some binding energy and um, a work function, that's the W. All right, so um, the experimental setup is that these electrons are being caught on, uh, on a cathode and one can measure the velocity or the energy um, of these um, uh, electrons. And the interesting thing is that there is a cutoff of, uh, below which frequency there is no, uh, there are no electrons coming out. So that's the experimental observation and then the intensity goes up with the frequency. Okay, so the absorption occurs in quanta and is consistent with, pho uh, with photons. All right, so if I now go back to what I had discussed earlier, right? Particles have all par uh, particles can have wave properties. They can interfere and um, diffract. They can form standing waves, and all waves have particle pro uh, properties. They have momentum. They have an energy, and they can be created and destroyed. And the typical descriptions you choose is that uh, it depends on on what you like to describe. These uh, particle or wave duality, the particle wa uh, description or wave description really depends on what is convenient for you to use as a description. They're not at odds with, with each other. So um, typically you have energy, frequency, and momentum that describe these waves and particles, and you have discrete numbers uh, that are quantum numbers. And again, you choose uh, uh, what you what you um, model, wave or particle, depending on the problem that you try to describe. So let's uh, uh, just go into a little bit more detail here. We we just sketch here out uh, the Dirac equation uh, relating the rest energy to the kinetic energy of a particle, and if you do this for uh, photons, their rest energy or rest mass is zero, and you can relate the energy of a photon to its to its kinetic energy here. And if you relate uh, the momentum uh, to its frequency, then you can uh, relate the momentum to at the end to momentum is h bar k. Uh, 
and you can relate the momentum to a wavelength. So that is an embodiment of the wave particle duality for photons. All right, so, so we talked about all these strange experimental results, black body, um, radiation, meaning light emission is quantized, di discrete optical spectra, light emission and absorption is quantized, the advent of the Bohr atom. The uh, photoelectric effect uh, really homed in on light being uh, described by particles and then ultimately the particle wave duality as being useful for describing physical systems. So all of these experimental results and concepts really guided the community, the researchers, into the creation of quantum mechanics. And uh, in the next section, uh, I'll highlight again a little bit why we would care and what we would get out of it for, for learning about the quantum mechanical uh, foundations. Thank you.